And that's where I really started sort of solidifying my ideas around what you might call biological neural computation and how different it was to, or how different it is to, um, you know, standard artificial neural networks and machine learning. How much of the brain can be understood in terms of these principles? Now, obviously, you can't understand the principles individually. You do need to understand the principles individually. But if you want to look at the, how the brain works, individually is not going to cut it. Even your thoughts for the future are really just predictions, right? It's a principle that should be understood from a brain building block perspective. This is Brain Inspired. I'm Paul. Peter Stratton is my guest today. Pete is a research scientist at Queensland University of Technology, and I was pointed his way by a Patreon supporter who sent me a sort of perspective piece that Pete wrote, uh, which is the main focus of our conversation, although we also talk about some of his work in particular. For example, he works with spiking neural networks like my last guest, Dan Goodman. What Pete argues for is what he calls a sideways-in approach. So a bottom-up approach is to build things like we find them in the brain, you know, put them together, and voila, we, we have cognition. On the other hand, a top-down approach, which is the current um, main approach in AI, for example, uh, you, you train a system to perform a task, you give it some algorithms to run, and you fiddle with the architecture and the lower-level details until you uh, pass your favorite benchmark test. Pete is more focused on the principles of computation that brains employ that current AI doesn't. So if you're familiar with David Marr, um, this is akin to his so-called algorithmic level, uh, but it's between that and the implementation level, I'd say, uh, because Pete is focused on the synthesis of different kinds of brain operations, how they intermingle to perform computations and produce emergent properties. So he thinks more like a systems neuroscientist uh, in that respect. Figuring out how to synthesize these neural principles, Pete says, uh, will lead to better AI. So we discuss a handful of those principles um, all through the lens of how challenging a task it is to synthesize multiple principles into a coherent functioning whole as opposed to a collection of parts. But hey, evolution did it, so I'm sure we can too, right? By the way, I'll be in Lisbon, Portugal uh, at the end of February for the COSIGN conference. So if you're around uh, that conference and you want to say hi, please do. Thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you want to be able to reach out to me and influence who I invite on the podcast, for example, or you just want to show appreciation, consider supporting uh, Brain Inspired through Patreon. Go to braininspired.co to learn how. All right, thanks for listening. And here's Peter Stratton. It was actually a Patreon supporter slash listener who turned me on to a particular paper that you wrote. Um, and I was going to say recently, but when I looked it up, it was actually four years ago, I think, that when you actually wrote the, the manuscript of the paper called Convolutionary, Evolutionary, and Revolutionary, What's Next for Brains, Bodies, and AI? And this is a, um, a short, uh, I, I recommend the paper because it's short, but it's like packed full of uh, information and ideas. So it was like a really pleasant read. And so he, he sent this to me with a couple questions. I thought, oh, I should have Pete on the uh, on the podcast. So um, thanks for joining me here. Thank you for inviting me. One of the things I find interesting when we, and we're going to get into a lot of the ideas that you've written about, but one of the things I found interesting is that from what I understand about your background, it's in a computer, you have a computer science and artificial intelligence background. And yet what you write about and advocate for uh, in the paper are a lot of principles to build into artificial intelligence that are from the neurosciences. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I wonder where that came from and, and how you came about deciding that uh, maybe neural principles could be important. Um, it, it started in my PhD, I think. Um, I was quite interested in machine learning way back, uh, well, in the, the late 80s when backpropagation first appeared. Um, and in, my, in the 90s, I did my PhD and um, I was really interested in, in neural networks, but not so much in gradient descent. Um, even back then, I was thinking there's probably other ways of doing this. Gradient descent seemed like a very unbiological way of doing things. Um, and so I was more interested in this idea of self-organization, um, which has been looked at in the past and then kind of forgotten. 
Um, so then I think after the PhD, I, I then sort of spent some time in industry. Then I came back to to research, and uh, I spent about ten years um, at this um, institute called the Queensland Brain Institute. Um, and literally, I was the more or less the data scientist, um, looking at all these uh, all the data from neuroscience experiments. And um, and that's where I really started sort of solidifying my ideas around what you might call biological neural computation and how different it was to, or how different it is to, um, you know, standard artificial neural networks and machine learning. Um, and when I look at the capabilities of, you know, even simple brains like, um, like flies, insects, things like that, you know, the, the Drosophila, the Drosophila melanogaster that they often do experiments on, I think, um, has about 100,000 neurons in its brain. And yet it has a massive, you know, behavioral and survival repertoire. You know, it's amazing. And these animals seem to sleep and they do all sorts of interesting things. Um, and then the bee, you know, the, the, the standard honeybee, um, about a million neurons and, you know, incredible behavioral repertoire. You know, they communicate, they do the waggle dance to tell each other how far away, um, uh, sources of pollen are and things like this. So these neural networks are, um, tiny compared to, you know, our large language models and the biggest models that we currently work on, but immensely capable. And I guess the, the interesting question is, how do they do that? And so that's what I'm most interested in. Oh, I want to come back to this because the, the examples that you gave are all about behavior. So, and, and we'll come back to this idea, but the, one of the first things you said was that you became interested partly at least because of back propagation, but then you weren't actually interested in stochastic gradient descent. But and you said in the '80s when these algorithms were, you know, written down on paper, um, but it didn't work so so well back then, right? Um, and, and but you were interested in it uh, even so. So so the story of backpropagation, right? Is it um, it it kind of worked a little bit, but uh, you know, it took like 20 years for enough data to scale up essentially in computational power, and then all of a sudden backpropagation really worked to train these networks. But but you saw that algorithm and that piqued your interest. It did because it was so different from, you know, standard von Neumann computation, right? And it was mm -hmm. using these things called, you know, um, units or cells or, you know, I guess neurons, you could call them, um, these little processing units all connected um, together in, in parallel. So it was doing a lot of, you know, this idea of parallel computation, which obviously is, is also what the brain is doing at a very kind of like basic level. Um, there's some analogies there. So that's what got me interested. It was like, well, okay, this is something along the lines of what the brain might be doing. Um, but it's also got to be very different. So what is your just overall take then, given the massive success, quote unquote, of these uh, deep learning networks these days that are, are essentially built off of, you know, relatively few neural principles and then a lot of computation and a few tricks and bells and whistles um, are you not impressed by them like everyone else? Or are you going to say, of course, I'm impressed by them, but? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you called it. Um, they're they're very, very impressive in what they can do, right? Especially these large language models. It just seems to be a step change in um, in capability. Um, and it's, it's got a lot of people interested, you know, in the general public and a lot of, you know, let's face it, a lot of scientists as well. Um, no one really understands how these things work. We can We can build them, we can train them. But, you know, how do they actually work uh, mechanistically um, inside is, is quite a mystery. Um, mm. So they're very interesting. Um, and honestly, yeah, also, I've got to say the, the, ca the capabilities of these networks has surpassed anything that I expected um, gradient descent to be able to do. Um, and I think a lot of people are probably in the same boat as me in regards to that. Um, so. How is this? How has this been possible? I think it's just a matter of, the, of these networks getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, they're they're ridiculously sized now, uh, and the amount of training data that you're able to to throw at them. I still believe that um, gradient descent is quite a, a, an inefficient way of of learning. It's just that we do have such huge amounts of data now and access to huge compute um, resources. You know, data warehouses and um, which is what you need to actually train one of these models. Um, and I think that's just made it, that's made it possible. It's not, it's not so much the, the technology or our understanding that has progressed. It's literally just, it's a, it's brute forcing the problem, I guess, um, without really understanding how we're doing it.
Yeah, I, I, I've i been trying to avoid the term brute forcing because I think I've used it on the last few episodes. <laughs> okay. I was just thinking on the train ride home. No, no, you should use it, but I feel like I'm overusing it. So I'm glad that you used it. Right. <laughs> uh, but so, so do you think like something like gradient descent then in, you know, once we, we um, build in these principles that, that we're going to talk about in this episode will be seen as a capable but just inefficient way of doing the same kinds of things that um, future AI uh, networks will do? systems? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's, you know, I would have said, I think, like I just said, it, it, it surprises me how capable these things are now, and that this is even possible. So I'm kind of like loath to say that we've reached the limit or we've hit the wall, right, in, in terms of what gradient descent can actually do. Yeah, that's that's a fool's errand, <laughs> it seems, these I days. I think so. I think so. Um, as long as the amount of data that we have access to keeps going up and and our, our computers keep getting more powerful or bigger um, you know bigger data centers throwing out you know more bigger bigger GPUs I mean that's really what's driven this um, then you know the, the potential is I guess theoretically limitless but in practice you know the fact that um, these models seem to be getting exponentially bigger you know they're basically growing by an order of magnitude in size every year and the amount of power um, required to train them is also growing, you know, about the same in order of magnitude every year, um, and the cost is is substantial. You know, it's it's got to the point now where it's only the biggest, um, basically, tech companies can actually afford to train one of these models. Um, it, it's cost in the order of ten million to a hundred million dollars to you know, that's a hundred million, you know, real U.S. dollars to train one of these large language models. Now, um, yeah. it's an insane amount of money. Um, so, how much bigger can these models get? before people go, we just can't afford to train them anymore. There's not enough um, compute and or money in the world to actually do this. Um, now, where there, there has to be a limit. I'm just not quite sure where that limit is. So, you know, other people have obviously recognized this and they're, um, they're looking at ways of making um, training AI or training artificial neural networks using gradient descent. Uh, they're looking at ways of making that more efficient. Um, and there's certainly efficiencies to be gained um, in, in building some more, you know, uh, specific purpose-built hardware and things like that but in terms yeah. of these like multiple orders of magnitudes of improvement i don't see that happening so to come back to your original question um the world is an extremely complex place right now yes learning how to generate text um and even look at images and things like that it's 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 achievable if you've got say a hundred million dollars in your pocket um <laughs> But the world is way more complex than sets of images and text, you know. So if you're looking at actually creating general purpose AI, for instance, general purpose robots and things like this, like I said, I'm not going to say it's impossible using gradient descent, but I just feel like it it's going to be very, very difficult and extremely, exceedingly expensive um, to, to do that, um, at least with current technology or with anything that we have um, sort of like even in the pipeline. So... The, and the other problem with with robots is actually um, gathering the training data. You know, mm. um, there's a huge amount of like you know, whatever petabytes of of text data and images on the web, um, which you can basically have a, in, you know, instant access to. But if you're trying to gather training data for for robots in the real world, you really it gets a lot slower, right? And can you get enough training data for that um, for real to do real robotics in the real world? Is another kind of unknown at the moment. You know, there's a lot of people working on simulation environments, um, but again, simulation is never the same as as the real world, um, and you can't do that. You know, you can't simulate data as efficiently as you can collect it. Um, not not if you want it to be you know really real. So there's a lot of impediments to um, what you might call AGI or at least general purpose robots, um, if you kind of want to call them sort of the same thing. Um, there's a lot of impediments to doing that with gradient descent that I currently don't see easy ways around. Hmm. Yeah, this goes back to um, you, you mentioning the the importance of the of the impressive behaviors of honeybees and fly fruit flies. Um, and I know a behavior is important to you, and and you've worked on you know robotics and I mean, in a sense, do you think that more of X Paradox is even heightened now that, you know, so we have these, you know, more of X uh, paradox is the idea that it turns out that what we thought was hard to do is actually rather easy, like training 
AIs to play good chess and go and stuff. And what we thought was easy to do, like catching a ball, um, is actually difficult to do. And perhaps that's even more highlighted now than it ever has been. I, I don't even know the current state of robotics, so maybe you can catch me up to speed on that. I just know that they have traditionally been lagging behind these systems that don't actually need to behave in any way. Right. So there's a, there's a few different angles to that. Um, so there's even some work going on here um, in, in Australia, in, in the institute that I work at, where we're, um, there are some some researchers trying to make robotics move more fluidly, um, more like people. So, you know, trying to get a, um, if you, if you look at a, a typical robot, if it, if it, if you give it the task of, you know, going to a table and, and picking up a, a can, say, um, it, it, it moves, you know, for want of a better word, it moves very robotically, you know, it will approach the table, then it will stop, you know, and then this this lever will come out with a with a gripper on the end, and it will move slowly and in a straight line towards the towards the can. And you know, then it will stop, and then it will grasp the can, and it 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 just looks robotic, right? And so, um, there's clearly different ways that biology solve these problems. Um, and there's people here working on that. So now we've got uh, a, quite an impressive demonstration uh, that I wasn't involved in at all, um, but basically where a robot can be moving past a table quite quite rapidly. And fluidly and dynamically actually grasp something on the table as it goes past. Mm. Now oh, this is cool. this is quite an impressive feat. And when you see the um, when you see the videos, it's um, it looks really really different. It looks organic. Um, so th this this has not been solved um, using um, terribly many neural networks or biological um, sort of motion and muscle principles. It's it's still going back to kind of like first principles in robotics, but doing it in a very very clever way. Um, what so, are those like feedback loops? And, yeah, it has to be closed uh, yeah. for a start. Yeah, and you, yeah. you're basically um, you're continuously sensing your position and um, your gripper position relative to the object you want to grasp, and it's all about closed loop and dynamic updates and things like that. Yeah, um, which you know is kind of like a no-brainer, really, when you think about it. And when you see the demo, you go, "Yeah, why hasn't why hasn't it always been done that way?" Um, I think, and again, this is one of the first problems in in robotics. It's a, it's a lot about sort of breaking up problem down it's this like divide and conquer and it's the um yeah it's the stepwise refinement that, that engineers like to do to kind of like isolate problems and and go okay well the first step is to get to the table you know and then the second step is to work out right. what i need to grasp and the third step is to put my gripper close to the cup you know and things like this and engineers like to break this down um and that's not how biology does it so if it, again it, it seems to be quite often the case that if you take um uh, inspiration from biology, you can actually solve these problems um, in a in a much more dynamic and robust fashion, and I think that's what the, the team here has been trying to do. So that's one of the issues, I guess, with robotics. It's just not fluid. It's too overly engineered, um, which basically means that it's it looks robotic, and the solutions are often brittle. Um, mm. Now, obviously, the the brain. Sort of uses the same principles of you know robustness and closed loop control, um, but it the the processing behind that is very different, um, and that that leads into the second thing about robotics and why I think robotics is probably useful for AI is because our intelligence is actually built on controlling our body in the world, you know, um, this whole. Um, capacity we have for things like abstract thought and language and all that stuff, the, um, the amazing you know high level abstractions that, that the human brain and, and other you know higher animals can do, um, didn't come out of nowhere and it, it didn't it didn't appear um, in an isolated sort of uh, environment. It, it appeared in the world, um, in the in the physical world, in bodies that are actually needing to survive in the world. Um, and it seems like a lot of the um, principles, the computational principles that are used by much simpler animals are actually kind of like adopted and co-opted into the uh, the higher level processing that our brain is capable of doing. So if we want to understand intelligence, um, whatever that actually means, I mean, it's obviously very hard to define, right? Thank but you, if, yep. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to actually understand it, then, um, and, and even come up with a good definition for it, Right then, then we really need to be looking at simpler animals and how they process sensory stimuli and control the body in the world, um, and then how we can co-opt 
some of those principles for higher level processing. And that's exactly what our brains seem to be doing. So that, that so, leads to this, maybe you wanted to bring it up, I'm sorry, maybe later, but um, it's the idea of the embodied Turing test, you know, that, that quite a few yeah. eminent AI researchers have, have kind of um, alluded to recently in a, in a nature paper a couple of years ago, um, basically saying that, you know, if we want to understand intelligence, then we really need to understand how simple creatures survive in the world and then build up from there rather than diving straight into these high level, um, you know, sort of like symbolic um, reasoning processes that the human brain is capable of doing. Um, start simple and and see how that leads to our capabilities, right? And and the understanding of the nuts and bolts behind the high level reasoning that we're capable of doing is what we're currently lacking. So it's um, there, there's a lot there to uh, respond to and, di <laughs> and digest, actually. So I, I recently had... Um my friend John Krakauer on the podcast, and he's a neuroscientist, and he actually argues directly against that. So, so I am, um, I love the idea of thinking of higher cognition and thoughts as analogous to internalized movements, right? And and it's interesting that you, you know, we started off talking about feedback loops and robotics. Uh, actually, I had a, a guest on many moons ago now, Henry Yen, who thinks that neuroscience essentially needs a revolution. The, uh, like a paradigmatic revolution in the Kuhnian sense, in terms of thinking of cognition as just nested uh, hierarchical feed lap, feedback loops, essentially all the way up into our cognition, which is in line with that idea of thought as being analogous to internal kinds of movements or actions, right? But John argues that um, he thinks it's ironic, for example, that you know the the latest great AI is built on not on things like that, not on things that are that lower, lower animals, other smaller mammals, et cetera, are capable of doing, but are built on what we as humans are capable of doing. And that there might very well be, and he argues that there is a break between um, f understanding how things move in the world and those principles and the principles of higher level cognition, um, that there's likely a that they're just worlds apart to him. And, and he, he doesn't uh, agree with the idea of the embodied, inactive, the 4E approach to studying as, that, as a gateway to studying higher cognition, essentially. So uh, do you, I mean, do you think that there's like just a stepwise way from, of going from what you, you know, from simpler animals, that's a better way to say it, uh, and studying how they survive and move in the world to higher cognition, or will there need to be different principles uh, that we'll have to, uh, grapple with and understand. It's interesting. I find it interesting that a, that a neuroscientist will actually um, have that point of view. Um, to me, when you look at the brain, right, uh, and I, like I said, I spent ten years in a, in a brain institute. Um, this idea that that you know what you might call thought is really just um, internalized and abstracted action. Right, um, which is something you just said, and it's, it's also something I mentioned in the in the paper that, that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, yep, that just makes sense. From a um, there's there's a lot of evidence that that is kind of how the brain works, and it's how we behave as well. Um, so in terms of how the brain works, if you look at the brain, you know the 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 frontal lobes where you know basically most of our actions are represented. You could say at a, at a very coarse level, you know the the front of the brain, the frontal lobe is is more for action and movement, and um, the back of the brain is, is more for um, perception, um, sensory perception. So, you know, that, that's obviously a very coarse generalization, but um, you, can, you can start with that. And then if you look at um, just um, forward of the, um, what's it called, the central sulcus? Of lost central someone. sulcus. Yeah, yeah. Is that, that's the, the line that goes this way across, across your brain that basically divides the front half and the back half of the brain. So directly yeah. forward of that is your basically your muscle representation. You have a representation of all the muscles in your body. And again, it's like the sensory homunculus. It's basically laid out in the shape of a body in your brain. Um, and triggering those neurons, if you, you know, stimulate one of those neurons with an electrode or something, it'll cause a muscle twitch somewhere in your body. Um, so you can map out this, you can map out this um, body map Homun in the brain. Yeah. The homunculus. homunculus. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Right. So... Um, as you go forward from there, you go from motor, that's called motor, M, uh, motor region M1. As you go to M2, um, basically these are combinations of muscle actions that, that occur over time, say. So, you know, repetitive, um, easily repeated 
well memorized movements are represented there. Um, and these neurons tend to fire, you know, like a, a few hundred milliseconds before the actual motor neurons fire um, when you're about to, to do an action. And then as you move further and further forward um, in, your, in your frontal lobe, basically what seems to happen is you're getting um, longer and longer sort of temporal representations. So representations of in time of movements that you are potentially going to do um, further in the future. So, you know, you have a, um, you potentially have a, I'm going to go shopping kind of like neuron somewhere in your brain. And it's not, it, obviously it's not a grandmother neuron and it's not that simple, right. but there is some representation in your frontal lobes of doing the action of going shopping um, or driving a car or things like this, you know, some very high level neurons in your brain. Um, and all these things are basically, you can call them abstracted actions or delayed actions or compound actions or something like that. You could also call them in a way concepts. Right. And this is where, you know, a lot of concepts are actually tied to um, what that means for us as an embodied agent in the world. Um, and these high level concepts really stem from just delayed and abstracted actions. Um, and you can see that, you know, even, you know, like phylogenetically and, and evolutionarily in, in the way that um, brains have developed over time, um, the simpler um, vertebrates, for example, have very small, you know, frontal cortices or almost no frontal cortex at all. Um, and then the more ability you have for abstract thought is this frontal lobe that's really exploded in humans, right? Um, and it literally just builds off the simpler actions that are represented in, um, in the brains of simpler animals and also in our brain in the lower level regions of the, of the frontal cortices. Um, so that's kind of like the, that's the evidence from the neuroscience perspective in any case that, that this is what's going on everything stems from low level actions um, in terms of you know the structure of the brain from low level concepts and low level actions up to high level concepts and high level actions so everything if you think about it everything we do and everything we think is really just ultimately leading to some sort of action right um it can be action like, you know, we can make plans for, for years or decades in the future, and that's our brain. Simpler animals don't have the capacity to think that far ahead, you know. Um, and the very simplest ones are simply like, you know, stimulus response, you know, like um, mollusks and things like this, right? They have, they have very simple nervous systems, but no ability to, to um, abstract into the future. Hmm. So there's definitely evidence from neuroscience um, that kind of shows this. And also, when you look at even at the structure of the brain across the cortex, um, from these low level motor regions up to the very high level regions, the, the structure is also really, really strikingly similar um, in the, in, you know, across, across the entire motor or frontal cortex, but also even in the, in the sensory cortices, the actual structure of the brain in the cortex itself is remarkably similar, whether that part of the brain is, is devoted primarily to sensory processing or primarily to, to coordinating um, muscle movements and motor actions and abstract thought. It's, it's very difficult to tell, um, unless you're an expert, you know, by looking at a slice of cortex, am I looking at sensory cortex or motor cortex? You know, right. it's often quite hard to tell. So there's, there's really, really similar processes going on um, in all these different parts of the brain. Um, so if you're saying that there's something very, particular that humans can do in terms of abstract thought you need to explain why that would be the case when the actual substrate that, that seems to carry that out is the same across across all brains yeah well I, I don't i'm not saying that he's saying that he has the solution but you know so for example and, and we don't need to harp on this for long but the example that he regularly gives is you know if i tell you to go to imagine standing outside your own home and then walking through the door and going to the kitchen to get a butter knife, uh, then opening the fridge, you know, you can imagine all that without moving at all. Mm -hmm. And that there's simply no evidence that any other species can do this, right? Um, that, that, that's the most parsimonious explanation. And so uh, we need to be able to explain those higher level kind of processes. Um, and he, does, he doesn't believe that there's a continuous path from simple movement to high level thought. Okay. So, yeah, I mean that's an interesting point of view, and obviously this is this is um, I wouldn't call it contentious, but this is undecided, right? So right. <laughs> um, there's definitely, and anyone who says that it's that it is decided is is you know obviously I, I, I would disagree with, right? <laughs> that's the one thing I can <laughs> right. say for sure. 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff that we just don't know about the brain, and and uh, and I think this this disagreement that uh, that I have with this guy would would obviously be just a um, an indication of that. So it's no yeah. problem. It's just um, the way science works. Right. Yeah. Uh, quickly, I haven't asked this of anyone in a while. Where, where are we? Do you think in neuroscience and understanding the brain? Are we at the beginning? Are we in the middle? Are we close to it? <laughs> That's a difficult question. I would say it's it's um, it's a bit of a cliche to say, but it's it's the more we understand about the brain, the more we know that we don't know, right? Oh my God, and, I've said this exact <laughs> phrase that again. That's, that's another thing I'm trying to not say very frequently. So I'm glad you're it's, saying it. I, I, yeah. I got to apologize. Um, I knew that, that was a bit of a cliche, but it, it's kind of true, right? Um, yeah. So you know, uh, my kids have asked me the same question: How far are you to creating AGI? You know, um, right. or whatever. And it's it's along the lines of, don't really know, but it's somewhere between um, probably a thousandth of a percent and one percent. You know, probably oh, more like a thousandth okay. of a percent. So, uh, and our actual understanding of the brain is probably similar, I would say. Um, mm. Yeah, and we understand so much about the components of the brain. You know. Um, down to you know basically the molecular scale, you know the yeah. the gates um, and the, the neurotransmitters, you know the the actual um, the chemicals, you know um, all the, all the neuromodulators and all that sort of thing. We understand exactly, almost exactly how they work. You know we can even simulate the molecular movements, you know, on a supercomputer to show how the gates work and things like this. But how it all holds together, you know, where we really fall down is in the uh, the emergent dynamics and the emergent properties of the brain um and that's what we don't understand and that's is that neuroscience even or is that uh, is that computation or or engineering or or physics you know there's a lot of physics involved in this as well uh but mm. physics is a lot about emergent properties um uh, and uh, emergent dynamics even you know um so you know it might not in the end it might not even be a neuroscience problem or you'd have to redefine what you mean by neuroscience it's more like it's more like what I'm interested in, which is neuroscience and neurocomputation, I guess, and neuro AI. Mm. But it's really kind of like a separate field to neuroscience because we take what we know about the brain from neuroscience and then we try to to construct models um, and understand the emergence that's going on. But before we get into, because I um, I wanted to just jump right into the ideas in your paper, but before we get into that, wh wh how would you describe your overall goal? Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, I mean, that's a good question too. <laughs> um, I guess on what level, the, like um, the reason I well, the reason why I ask is tied to the way that you present all these principles in the paper, and it's tied to the what you just said about it. It really hangs, or really, it's about how all these things hang together, and that's what we're going to get into in a minute. And so, so then I wonder, like, well, are you? It's an ambitious goal to synthesize all these principles um, and that we're not going to go through all the principles that you talk about in the paper, but I thought, well, is that your goal to like uh, kind of step by step incorporate these things until you have them all incorporated into the, and build these emergent systems and emergent computations? Um, look, given, given enough time, but you know, perhaps like a, a semi infinite life, I guess that would be my goal. Yeah. Um, but given that, that I'm probably not going to have time to, to do all of that. Um, I guess it would be the goal would be to kickstart that process um, and to get people aware of you know what we do know about the brain and how that we can actually leverage that into building better AI you know which is what this paper was all about um, mm. so you know at one level my goal is to just you know <laughs> enjoy what I do uh, and follow my curiosity you know uh, which is kind of yeah. like you know, I guess the ultimate goal of, of pure science um, but then I guess you also need to have concrete goals and, uh, in order to keep yourself honest and, and, and actually do something useful. So in terms of that, yes, it would be to, to take these principles and, uh, and start putting them together and then understand it. You know that the, each principle alone doesn't do much, right? Um, it's only when you combine them that you start getting, um, you know, kind of like potentially building useful emergent systems. Um, and so you need to try to understand that emergence. And, and like I mentioned before, that's where we really fall down in these, these complex mm. systems. You know, we, you can't write an equation that actually solves these things. You really, um, um, you need to build it and understand it from a, from an emergent point of view. 
Okay. Well, like I said, it's ambitious. And I'm about to read 13 different principles that you <laughs> list toward the toward the end of your paper at the risk of losing the listeners. But I, I do it just because to um, to highlight the the ambition and the difficulty of uh, of going down that road and trying to incorporate all these things so that they hang together. Okay. So sparse spike time coding, self-organization, short-term plasticity, reward learning, homeostasis, feedback predictive circuits, conduction delays, that one's not often mentioned, oscillations, innate dynamics, stochastic sampling, multi-scale inhibition, K winner take all, and embodied coupling. So I don't even know where to begin. So <laughs> what does it all I, mean? I know that, well, well, yeah, well, it's all in the paper. So I'll, I'll <laughs> refer people right, to the paper where, where you, um, where you discuss all these principles in more detail. But the idea of, so you just got done saying that we, we understand so little of the brain, but then there are these 13 principles that you find are probably super important to be able to build, uh, not separately, but together and have everything work in a synthetic fashion to generate these emergent properties uh, of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we know more than uh, we think we do if, if we can point to these principles. You know, personally, I would like to think so. And, and, you know, I tried to make the list exhaustive, but I think that's rather conceited to actually believe that it would be, right? I mean, I think there are principles that we don't currently understand um, that we don't even kind of like, uh, we have no idea of the uh, potential existence of, you know, or the requirement for. Um, okay. So I imagine that list is going to get to get bigger. At the moment, I think, yeah, I've tried to basically capture everything, all the high level kind of like me mechanistic principles that the brain seems to be using to perform computation. Um, and these are the ones, you know, I'm not, I'm obviously not the first one to to talk about these principles. Um, that each each one has been independently researched. Um, right. And like I say in the paper, some of them are, are quite extensively researched. Um, I might be the first one to put them all together, but again, uh, I, I, that's probably not true. Um, so it's just a matter of how much of the brain can be understood in terms of these principles. Now, obviously, it's it's not you can't understand the principles individually. You do need to understand the principles individually, but if you want to look at the how the brain works individually, is not going to cut it. We're going to need to to combine them and have a look at the resulting. Um, I keep using the word emergent, so I'm I'm overusing that now. But look at look at the resulting properties of the the system as a whole, and that's the only way to actually understand um, to understand neural computation. Mm. Um, when we do that, so when we do start putting them all together, and I, and that this is one thing I do say in the paper, there haven't been very many attempts to actually put these principles together, even though individually they've been, some of them are reasonably well understood. Um, the, the real value in understanding these as mechanisms is when we try to unite them, um, as the brain has done quite successfully. So when we start doing that, um, I think it's going to be quite likely that other principles will emerge, or at least the requirement for other principles will emerge. Because oh. we'll put these things together and, and the models still won't be working, you know, like the brain. Um, something will go awry or something will just, you know, not work at all. Um, and, and in which case we then, we can then, we have the, the ability then to look at the model and go, well, what seems to be missing? Um, and then we can look back to, to neuroscience and, and this is quite often what happens. You know, you build a model and, for instance, a model of, of STDP, the spike time independent plasticity. Um, and then you realize that, okay, um, STDP is pretty much unbounded. You know, these, these synaptic connections are more or less unbounded um, if in pure theoretical STDP. And that can't happen in the brain. There has to be some sort of like normalization process going on. And of course, we have normalization in our deep networks, right? Um, and that, that comes about purely through a, you know, an actual practical requirement for it. Um, and the same happens in the brain. So then you start looking at things like, okay, there must be homeostatic processes in the brain. And it turns out there are, there are a heap of them. Um, that do basically the, the normalization. They, they do it in a more biologically, you know, realistic way, obviously, um, rather than just summing weights and, 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 you know, dividing by the number of weights and, you know, whatever, doing L1 or L2 normalization. The brain is not doing that, but it's, it's, it, it has a similar, um, ultimate functional goal of normalization in artificial neural networks. So that's where the homeostasis comes in. You realize you need the, you need the mechanism. So you can look to biology to go, okay, how does biology accomplish this? 
And quite often the information is there already in, in neuroscience. You just need to basically uh, digest and, and absorb that into your model. Um, and there will be other things that other principles that, that we're going to need to incorporate. I, I can be almost certain about that. I mean, the ones that I just listed off also are, they, they do sound like a bottom-up approach, right? They sound like kind of low-level mechanistic uh, processes. Um, but, you know, you write in, in the paper that what you're taking is a, is a side-in side approach. Sideways in. Yeah, sideways, yeah. sideways in approach. Yeah. So maybe you just describe that because it does sound like a list of lower-level processes. Well, they're sort of low level in, in as much as you can you can name them, you know, and, and the homeostasis in, in some cases is like normalization, you know. Um, so, but but mechanistically, that can actually em embody a, quite a, a complex, you know, biological process underneath that. Um, and that doesn't necessarily need to be modeled from a bottom up point of view. Um, so the the um, the functional goals of some of these mechanisms uh, Potentially implemented with very complex biological mechanisms. You don't need to actually do that as a in a bottom-up, faithful sort of a fashion. Um, you can sort of abstract the functional goal out and just do that in the simplest computational way possible. So that's kind of what I mean by the sideways in. So when it comes to you know um, uh, like the 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 model the the modeling system called um, called neuron, you know that that models um, you know physical neurons and channel densities and this sort of thing and ion channels in, yeah, ion yeah. channels and, and um, dendrites and axons in, in in actual their full 3d glory you know i don't think we need to do that to understand um at least the basics of neural computation you know um there's obviously nuances there and i think if you wanted to actually reproduce uh you know a specific brain for example well then yes you're going to need to model those things but if you just mm -hmm. want to model um, neural computation at a core scale, um, you probably you probably don't need to do that level of uh, biophysical detail, I would say. So that's what I mean by not doing the bottom up. You know, some of these processes are, uh, like I said, very compu very complex biologically, but we can actually just abstract them away. Um, and as long as you get that, the the really important thing then is what level of abstraction is sufficient. You know, right? Uh, and what level of abstraction is too much? You know, because at, at some point, if you abstract too much away, then you start losing some of these emergent properties and you don't want to do that. Yeah, well, that's that was uh, maybe my next question is, I mean, you look at a list like this and these are all biological processes and and then you think, OK, I'm going to abstract away what's unnecessary from them all and then somehow piece them together. But this is something that evolution has done over eons and eons and eons. And it just seems like a tall order for us to um and, and maybe a bit of um, hubris uh, for us to be able to say, okay, well, I'll just take all of these things and just I, I can just program oscillations in this one program, and then I'm going to uh, merge it with homeostasis in another program and reward learning with another program uh, at a abstract level that feels comfortable to me without even knowing, you know, like whether the biological processes, what levels are important for their integration, right? Uh, it, it, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's that's obviously a very, very good point. Um, <laughs> and that comes back to, you know, probably other mechanisms will be required. Um, probably some of these mechanisms will need to be broken down into into simpler sub mechanisms when it comes mm -hmm. to it. And I think it all it all just comes down to the fact that, you know, we don't know what this model, these models will do until we build them. Right. Because there is com complexity science, you know, trying to understand the the science of complexity and emergence is is really in its infancy, right? So um, it's just one of those things where you've got to build it and see. And well, what's yeah. it not doing? What's what's not working? So when I, when I say oscillations, I think oscillations are themselves an emergent property of um, neurons and networks and spikes um, and you know inhibitory GABA um, expressing neurons. In combination with the excitatory, you know, um, AMPA expressing neurons and, and, and MDA, and I think all these things, oscillations themselves are an emergent property. I wouldn't want to be building oscillations of a given frequency into my model. I'd want that to be an emergent property because I think that's really important for um, you know this communication through coherence idea, um, where you know basically what that means is that different brain regions will oscillate in synchrony when they need to communicate. 
and they'll go out of phase or oscillate at different frequencies when they don't need to communicate. Um, and it's a very, very powerful idea. And this is one of those ideas that, that I think hasn't really been used in AI at all. You know, um, we're even, we can simulate the dynamics of this, um, of these processes in the brain, but it, in, in, in terms of, um, utilizing them for computation, uh, as far as I know, no one's ever tried to do that. Um, at least not at more than a, a very sort of basic level. Um, so I wouldn't want to program the oscillations in. Oscillations are something that I want to have emerge because you never quite know when two brain regions are going to couple, you know, through synchronous oscillations or, you know, phase shifted oscillations as, as they need to do. So these sorts of things are just things that you need to build and, and see how it works. But so oscillations is a good example also where there's plenty of work looking into the potential causal properties of oscillations, you know, so yes, they're an emergent property, but then they can have a top-down um, effect on these lower-level components as well mm -hmm. as being generated by the lower-level components. So there's this inter-level play that, again, it, just, it seems like it's going to be daunting to find that right excitatory, inhibitory balance, to, you know, within a, a layer coupled with the homeostasis and for those oscillations to have the right effects when they need to have the right effects for the honeybee to do the waggle dance, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right, right. Good point. So um, I think this is actually something I, I allude to towards the end of the paper is that um, there is this idea that, that the more principles that you start uh, incorporating into your models, the more complex the model becomes and the harder it is to, to tune or to get to do anything. Um, and that's certainly, you know, that's certainly a, a, a relevant concern, concern, but the, the opposite might also be true. If you do incorporate, um, the right principles, for instance, some of this homeostasis, um, at, at potentially multiple different levels, because you mentioned levels as well. And that's another very interesting, um, interesting point. But if you do incorporate these principles, sometimes they become synergistic and they just work when you get the, when you get the combination just right. Um, now, and the homeostasis is a good one. Um, in the, in the models I'm building right now, I, I do have, you know, um, some simple homeostatic, um, processes going on. And it's amazing. Are these the spiking, spiking neural spiking, network models? Spiking that neural you're... network models okay. that I'm currently working on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's amazing how, how far you can push some of the other parameters in the model in terms of things like synaptic weights, for example, um, or the number of connections each neuron has. You can change some of these parameters that should wildly affect the dynamics. Um, but in the end, ultimately, they, they don't. The, the network just finds a happy operating point um, mm -hmm. somewhere in the parameter space due to the interplay between things like the homeostasis and the, uh, you know, the causal strengthening of synapses between neurons, this, this spike timing dependent plasticity. It will simply find uh, a happy operating point due to the interaction of these mechanisms. Um, and if you take one of the mechanisms out, the model then actually becomes quite unstable. So Brutal. it's actually yeah. when you put yeah. all these, when you get the right combination of mechanisms in there, it actually all just seems to work. Um, and I really believe, you know, the, the brain, um, this is, this is exactly what's happening in the brain. Um, the brain is at this sort of like, and this is where a lot of the physics comes in. And, and this is one reason why, um, you know, there are some eminent physicists who have gone into neuroscience because um, the brain dynamically seems to be operating at a, at a, you know, a critical point in its dynamics, at a, at a phase transition, basically, somewhere between, um, you know, seizure and random noise, you know, it seems to be where the brain is operating. Um, and our brains thread that needle, like, really, really well, you know, and that's why... Robustly. Very robustly, yeah, due to, it would seem, a lot of these homeostatic mechanisms. And things need to be pushed way out of, um, out of the operating region in order for, you know, thing, diseases like epilepsy, for example, um, to, to manifest because the brain is just so good at maintaining its dynamics in this critical um, region of phase space. And so the reason it, it's able to do this is through these homeostatic mechanisms. And as a, if, you can, if you can identify the right mechanisms, I think it will all just self-adjust, right? So the reason that spiking networks have been thought of as being you know, difficult slash impossible to work with and everyone basically... Everyone who, a lot of people who've had a go at, 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 at modeling spiking networks ultimately kind of like give up and, and go back to um, <laughs> either deep learning or, or doing, you know, gradient descent with spiking networks, for example, to try to like shoehorn yeah. that learning in there, you know. Um, right. and the reason being that they haven't actually just got the right combination of, of homeostatic principles, um, and, and some of these other mechanisms. When you get it right, 
it just works. Um, and that, that seems to be a, a fundamental principle of the brain um, that we really need to be cogent of, I think. You know, it, it's, it's really, you get that right, and then suddenly things start falling into place. This is a bit of an aside, but I'm sure some listeners are thinking, well, what about all of the psychological difficulties people are having, especially these days? If it's so robust and it just falls into place, why is psychosis up more than ever? Why are, why does everyone have ADHD? Why are we all depressed? Why you know? Um, I'm not sure if that's a fair question to ask you at this point because I know you're not a psychologist, but <laughs> I mean, one does wonder. You know, thinking of higher cognition and is there a continuum or is there a break and it's an emergent sort of property? And then, oh, are we really that robust or have we passed some point that uh, now we're you know skating on thin ice, etc. Yeah. Okay. So now we're kind of getting into, I guess, um, you might call it social neuroscience. Uh, I'm certainly interested in all in all the different neuroscience fields. I don't know terribly much about you know, social neuroscience, but um, I think, yeah, we are we are pushing the limits of what our, our brain has sort of evolved and is a, is capable of adapting to. You know, um, mm. in you know, the world has changed so much in the last even 20 years. You know, uh, and definitely like incredibly like it's unrecognizable from say 100 to 150 years ago um in terms of the the stress and strain we're putting on our brain with you know always on and, and always connected and the social media and, and things like this it's just not a natural environment uh, it's not what the brain well, maybe there's maybe it's too much leisure time now maybe we have it too you know things are too good they're better than they've ever been so we don't have to Think about where to get food, except for the shopping list. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely evidence for that too, in terms of yeah, the, the incidence of say depression and anxiety is is way lower in developing nations. Right. When when you are actually concerned about your day to day survival, you tend to not get depressed. You can be living in horrid conditions. Right. But yeah. because you actually have a, a a real like you know a literal goal to survive each day, <laughs> um, you don't. You yeah. literally just don't have time to to I guess. To get depressed, more or less, you know, you're too busy living, um, and it's only when you have sort of like this time to to ruminate, um, self reflect, and um, be on your screen and get bored, you know, watching TikTok clips and things like this. That's where um, that's where these kind of like psychological problems seem to start creeping in. And it's yeah. it's it, I would still go back to the fact that it's it's simply because our brain is not has not evolved in that sort of an environment. We're just not. We are not adapted to to live in a in a high tech world. Um, you know, I love getting out to, to nature, especially like the beach and, and swimming in water and things like that. Right? It's just it's so calming and so relaxing. You, you just you just feel good doing it. And I think that's there's a lot to be said. I mean, you know, you can get into the <laughs> the paraphysical interpretations and things like that that a lot of people do. But yeah, you know, I don't do that. I think it's just because it, it's where we grew up as a species, and I think it just feels mm -hmm. comfortable being there. Yeah, I'm not gonna pretend to be a uh, a um, well-being guru or anything because there are like debilitating um, psychological disorders that have nothing to do with TikTok and social media, you know. So it's not. I'm not trying to, um, you know, shortchange psychological disorders as being all about our modern leisure, lackadaisical lifestyles or anything. But um, there's probably something there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, and there's also a lot of, as you as you say, there's a lot of um, psychological problems that have been around forever as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I still, again, I think there's a reason for that. You know, um, if everyone was the same, um, if there was no kind of like a, we need a distribution of traits of you know um, phenotypes basically in in any species, because if every if everyone is specialized to um, excel in the current environment, right? If everyone is perfect for whatever it is you 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 currently do as a species um then if things change if there's some sort of like a, a catastrophe or you know a new predator appears or or whatever um then there'll be no one that is kind of like adept at dealing with that within your species and your species is likely to go extinct so you do need for instance you know an obvious one is you need people who are who are extroverted and bold you know and fearless right because when times are good they're the sort of people who are going to do really well in an environment, right? The ones who take risks. Um, whereas, you know, if things are not looking good for you, like environmentally speaking, or, you know, there's a new pathogen or something, what you really want are these fearful, you know, introverted type people 
who keep to themselves and don't like socializing. I'd say there's a new a new pandemic, for instance, back in in um, Neolithic days or something like that. Um, you want people who who basically are very fearful of this um, in order to you know because they will probably in that case be the ones who survive. So you need a, a broad range of phenotypes, um, and that it, it's a very like clinical and scientific way of looking at it. But that is one reason why you get such a diverse range of people. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes these phenotypes just push the limits so far that that you know fear leads to you know, anxiety, like, you know, like a, a, a constructive fear actually leads to, you know, more or less full time, full time anxiety and, and phobias and debilitating psychological trauma and things like that. Yeah. Um, and it's simply a consequence, I think, of, like I said, it's very scientific and clinical, but it's a consequence of having to, to maintain diverse phenotypes within a, within a population. So, Pete, I have you on record now saying that introverts are fearful and extroverts are bold. <laughs> I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't want. I yeah, don't want yeah. that to be the message. <laughs> no, no, not not entirely true. Obviously, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm a I'm a bold introvert myself. I'll say. <laughs> um, yeah, I, we could go down a very dangerous road here and get both of us in trouble. I suppose. <laughs> um, but uh, speaking of psychology, so so you know you're taking this sideways in approach, um, and. But I wonder, so an, another approach is this kind of top-down approach, the functionalist approach, right? Which is uh, in large part how large uh, language models and, and current deep learning have um, had the successes that they've had because they've been trained to do particular tasks. And it's the, through the learning of those tasks that their weights all get set in just the right way to perform the task very well, right? Um, and so in that respect, it's not, it's, it's more about the psychological, I'll use that term in air quotes, function um, that a network, let's say, is tasked to perform. And so I'm wondering if, because you don't, I don't think that you really talk about um, using that kind of functionalist um, behavior, top-down psychological function approach to sort of constrain models, right? A lot of what you talk about are these principles of neural computation. So are you more interested in, in the computational capabilities or the actual functional outputs, functional capabilities? Or, or another way to say that is: Do the psychological functional capabilities inform or or guide you at all, like in in thinking about neural computation? To answer that, I should I could potentially go back to this idea of the embodied Turing test. So, um, could you sorry? Could you ex just explain the embodied Turing test? I'm not. I don't think that you explained it earlier. Right. Sorry. Um, so it's this idea that yeah. Well, the, the basic idea is just that to understand intelligence, we need to understand the, the building blocks of the brain. And to understand the building blocks of the brain, we really need to go back to um, what simple oh. creatures do. Um, okay. From, say, you know, whatever, the simplest, even simplest animal with a nervous system, like a, 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 a sea slug or something like that. Or a, yeah. Sea elegance. Sea elegance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the way up to to us, but everything that's in between, um, because the, there are there are many things that are conserved from the simplest nervous system up to the to the most complex. Um, but what's the Turing test part of that? The Turing test is is, there... is basically you, the idea is you, you build um, you build robots that can do what animals can do, right? Oh, and so and so the Turing part of it is that I can't tell that octopus robot from a real octopus or something. Correct in terms of its behavior. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. that's right. So uh, the, the way they frame it in the paper is more or less like um, animals have these uh, competencies that, that we cannot currently replicate, you know, even with our best technology. So, uh, and they're obviously, these competencies are a, a function of their brains, right? But also their bodies and the fact that the brain is, is coupled with the body, you know? And of course, this is, this is a fairly pervasive idea. Um, everybody knows about it. But very few people actually um, pay it much heed or, or use it in their research, right? And so what this paper was was calling for was, okay, we actually need to start doing this um, in order to understand how the brain works. You know, you really need to start simple and put the brain in a body and and see what it can do when it interacts with the environment. Um, and so the, it becomes this entire, you know, the feedback loop, the closed loop between the brain, the body, and the environment. Back to the brain, you know, resensing. The brain does perform some action in the world. Um, it changes the next perception. The brain then processes that perception and decides on the next action and so on. 
obviously it's not that simple and there are multiple loops you know um, abstracted loops going all the way up and they all um interface and influence each other top down bottom up and sideways in right and um that's what we need to understand in terms of of understanding intelligence so it's a really completely different approach as you said to something like a large language model where it's basically just well let's just throw all this text at it and get it to predict the next word um and that's all that the large language models are doing but they do it extremely well and it turns out that they're in doing so they're they're formulating concepts like humor and even like a concept of awe and inspiration and all these things that are very very hard to define and pin down but you know, if you tell a large language model to to make up a joke, it will, and and occasionally they're even a little bit funny, you know. Um, so they've got some sort of idea of what humor actually is, right? And they they know what humor is when they see it, and they they're able to even generate it, um, novel instances of it, which is which is amazing. It's amazing what these things can do. But I think that's only it's a small fraction of what the brain can do. If you want to to put the parallel there between, okay. What part of the brain is, is a large language model actually emulating? I would say it is literally just the feed forward connections in the cortex. Wow. Okay. Right. And I think now, how would I justify that? Well, you know, large language models are, are typically there. They're all just feed forward. Um, there's a huge amount of feedback in the brain as well, which, um, is completely ignored in almost all our, our AI. We have very few, you know, effective recurrent models, I guess, in, in AI. Um, so these large language models are very good at extracting high level features from their input. And I think that's exactly what the, the cortex is doing, um, both sensory and motor. So it's, you know, um, perceptual feature extraction is what the sensory cortex cortices are, are doing. So, you know, you, you take individual edges at low level, say visual cortices, and they're combined into things like maybe like um, simple shapes. And then shapes are combined into things like faces and cars. And you have representations of these objects in your sensory cortices. And I think exactly the same thing is happening in your motor cortex. <clears throat> it more like temporal extraction, temporal feature extraction, which also happens in, you know, you have temporal, um, which means features that occur over time, you know, like moving yep. <clears throat> representations of moving objects and things like that. You get those in sensory cortices. In your motor cortices, you have representations of um, actions over time. Um, and it, it's doing motor feature abstraction. That's sort of what I've called it. Um, so you get perceptual feature extraction in sensory cortices and motor feature abstraction in your motor cortices. And it's the same process, just applied to different inputs, basically. Um, so if we want to understand the brain, we really need to understand those processes. And if we want to understand computation in the brain so neural computation we need to understand those processes and you're not going to do that just by throwing a, heart, a, a huge text corpus at a feed forward network you know you'll get a part of the brain you'll get like i think the mm. the feature extraction the feed forward feature extraction that's what you're getting in a large language model but you're not getting any anything else feedback connections out number feed forward connections in the brain um, so the feedback is obviously at least as important as the feed forward, possibly more important than the feed forward connections. Then you have all these subcortical connections as well. And then you have the body that the brain is, is in tightly innately coupled with. All these things influence and control and actually dictate what computation in the brain actually is. And a large language model has none of that. So you need to come at it from, and this is what I'm, this is what I'm advocating for. Um, you need to come at it from a holistic perspective, right? Hmm. we're not good at that <laughs> i'm not good at that yeah yeah it, that's true it's, i mean so, it's, it's difficult yeah. it's very difficult yeah it's not out yet but i i just had um a researcher dan goodman on the podcast and he specializes in working with spiking neural networks and he actually thinks that now is the time to be excited about spiking neural networks because of a recent uh, development in training them, which uh, kind of mimics backpropagation called surrogate gradient descent. But it is a, a global learning rule, right? And it still uses gradient descent. Right. But um, he's found a lot of success in how it works. But um, but would you agree that now would be the time to be excited about spiking neural networks? Or do you think, because you, you, know, you mentioned earlier, a lot of people shy <laughs> away from them or dabble in them and then go back to what works <laughs> because 
they're tricky and can be difficult and prickly, et cetera. But um, is that coming around? Are we going to see more and more spiking neural networks these days? Um, there's still there's still a very niche kind of research project. Um, the problem is that that for specific tasks, you know, deep networks, deep learning, and gradient descent works really, really well. There's there's no right. argument there, um, and it's it's all it's almost like a black box. That you you just you throw you can throw a problem at it, and because the there's been so many really smart people, you know, um, at Google and and various other places um, working on these you know, the, the Python packages for doing deep learning. Um, it really is literally a, a novice can almost come along now and construct a, a deep learning model. Um, spiking networks are not at that stage yet. You know, it's not that they can't be. It's just that the the um, research effort hasn't been applied to them as yet. Um, well, one one of the things he says is they're still really difficult to scale up because they're computationally really super expensive still. But but maybe that's using that gradient descent learning rule, and maybe like the local learning rules that you're implementing reduce that computational the computational um, requirements. Yeah, I mean, I think it also it, that's certainly part of it. It also comes down to just not understanding all the principles well enough, um, or at least you know there's a lot of like uh, little tweaks and heuristics in in deep learning. You know, like the dropout and right. Uh, things like that that you know that just seem to work uh, in in practice, and they're well implemented, and and you don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, that sort of overall like tweaking and heuristics and and um, polishing to the nth degree of the spiking network packages, you know, they they barely even exist now. You know, let alone okay. yeah. having been tweaked to the nth degree, they're just not, uh, and they're not out there. So. That's a big impediment, I think, to, to further research. And the problem is that the, the longer this status quo is maintained, the further behind spiking networks will will, will get uh, mm. potentially. So it's it's more or less a labor of love, and you've really got to embrace the vision and believe the vision of what spiking networks can be before you'll even spend time actually working on them. And <laughs> uh, and there's probably just not a lot of people who, who really. Um, Believe it that deeply. I think to to actually uh, take a take a gamble on their career and and go into spiking nets. Um, they are potentially, you know, and it's been shown theoretically that they're more powerful. Um, you know, it's it's rigorous. It's, it's they're rigorously more powerful than artificial neural mm -hmm. networks. Um, but they're just people think they're finicky and difficult. And yeah, sure, like theoretically they might be more powerful, but in practice they just don't seem to work. Um, and this is what people will say. So you know. That's that's the I guess the medium term goal is to kind of like um, leapfrog these chasms in in functionality and understanding and get spiking networks to the point where okay right they do seem to work and they do seem to have some advantages um, and when it gets to that point then I think people will start um, embracing them a little bit more easily and more often I want to hear you and more often I want to hear your kind of own and I'm sorry to put you on the spot um, if I'm putting you on the spot but your own roadmap in your head, right? So so now you've got like a pretty good spiking neural network model. And so are you going to take that and then start adding other things more to it? Or are you going to then build a, a different kind of model with say, you know, innate dynamics or something, you know, that the, the vision that you have to implement some innate dynamics or some self-organization and then try to marry them? Or like, do you see a roadmap for yourself moving forward? Like what's the low hanging fruit for mm -hmm, you? What's mm -hmm. the um, the the really difficult thing that the, the maybe the light at the end of the tunnel. Do you see that vision? <clears throat> so um, I think as a as a scientist, you kind of you tend to oscillate, right? Sometimes you're looking at the, the big picture um, and you try to build this this big roadmap for yourself, uh, and then other times you need to really bury yourself in the details, right? To actually uh, to yeah. make to make you know notable progress in on any one of those particular <laughs> problems, right? You really need I was to get say there. reality slaps you <laughs> in the face. Then <laughs> right, right, right. So this, yeah, this paper, um, as you said, I think I wrote it five years ago. Uh, but it was only published last year. Um, I, I didn't submit it uh, for for years. It was just sort of like lying around. Um, so that that paper five years ago was my my attempt, obviously, at the grand vision. Um, now I'm kind of buried in the details. So when you ask a question yeah. like, "What's the big roadmap?" Well. <laughs> What's tomorrow bring? Yeah, is one answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's a difficult question. Um, I think you know a lot of it is spelled out in the paper, um, in terms of you know incorporating these these all these mechanisms. Thirteen of them. You yeah. said. I'd never even counted them. 
So that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I actually enumerated <laughs> them because they're they're listed and yeah. But but you know the the order of adding them, right? So that that's why you know it's so ambitious because like, well, how do I even begin? Like, what is the easiest thing to begin with? What are the two things that I think I could get to integrate well in a in a model? You know, to get them working, and and so it's it's difficult to know what's most important on the list. Right. What's what's easiest? So etc. The models I'm currently building are using um, sparse spike coding, um, spike timing dependent plasticity, and homeostasis. So firing rate homeostasis. So each neuron has a set firing point that it, or you know, number of spikes at a time it would like to emit and you have a range of firing rates across the network um, there's also um, uh, weight homeostasis but it's it's different to just you know like l1 or l2 normalization it's basically trying to balance these networks also have a excitatory inhibitory balance um, which again seems to be another principle that might have been missed in machine learning community it's well known amongst neuroscientists and in the cortex there is this ei balance it's called um, and it turns out it's not there just for for looks or for um, for complex dynamics, right? Um, which the which the the cortex seems to generate. It's even it's even required in um, in feed forward networks to to maintain um, to maintain the the spike amplitudes or the um, the net input into each neuron as as information propagates through a um, through a multi layer network. You need this balance in order to actually maintain the the more or less you call it dynamics, the feed forward dynamics in a functional range, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that really hasn't been been recognised in the past. So what I'm doing now is I'm incorporating all of these um, principles um, into these networks, and right now just doing it on MNIST, right? Now I know MNIST is a is a solved problem. You know, a deep a deep network can get something like is it, what's the record now? Ninety nine point nine percent correct or something. I don't know, set. man. Yeah, it's no, it's basically yeah. it's better than humans do. You know, and again, you go, yeah. oh, how is that even possible? <laughs> um, these are handwritten digits, and now we've got AIs that can read them better than than people. Um, right. So it's solved in terms of gradient descent, right? And convolutional neural networks. A simple convolutional, you know, CNN can can solve MNIST um, for a, at least a. Um, a battery of them, you know, uh, uh, what they call the forest, or more or less of, of CNNs, mm. can solve it very well. Um, but in spiking networks, um, it, it's not—it's definitely not a solved problem. So um, we're, we're trying MNIST, more or less, as a checkpoint for ourselves. And it, on MNIST, we're getting better than, than any other non-convolutional architecture spiking network has ever has ever achieved on MNIST. So that's progress um, as far as spiking networks are concerned. Um, the next step would be probably to try it on a, on a bigger image type problem, because even people who um, I've, I've personally spoken to people who've been in spiking networks and they say, yeah, they work for MNIST, that's fine, uh, but they don't work for bigger problems. They they literally just fail. So that I think is that's tomorrow for me. Tomorrow <laughs> okay. is okay. Let's chuck you know uh, image net at a spiking net um, mm. and and see how it performs and can we get it close to um, you know, gradient descent for a similar network architecture. Um, that's pretty much my goal. My goal is to to look at the performance of gradient descent um, and get spiking networks to approach. They'll never be as good because there's there's no error propagation. There's no indication to the network of exactly what the output should be, right? Yeah. But the brain gets away with that, you know. Um, there's yeah, getting into the, the idea, is there gradient descent happening anywhere in the brain or something like back propagation? There probably is um, in specific regions and for specific tasks. But in general, mm. the cortex learns through self-organization. I think that's reasonably well accepted. It, uh, there'll be people who disagree, but um, they'll be in the minority, I think. So that would be the next, ta next task for spiking networks is just throw more complex problems at it that are already solved in the gradient descent field. But the more complex a problem we can solve, um, the more people will start taking notice of spiking networks, I think. Well, I th okay. So that's I was going to ask you if you feel bound to attack these benchmarks that have been set for what deep learning models have been successful at, uh, because you know that's not robotics and it's not what brains are for, right? Right. So it might be a different kinds of, and this goes back to me asking you about like the functional. Um, the psychological functions and you know cognitive functions that are more related to what humans do, and whether that might be 
if that's a step too far to start, you know, just asking about a different avenue of cognitive function rather than um, tackling these things that have, already been, that have already been done. But you just said uh, you do need people to pay attention to it and people will pay more attention to it when they start tackling these benchmark, same benchmark te tests, I suppose. That's exactly right. Uh, it, it, uh, for one thing, it, it's, it, it, well, there's three things. Yes, people will pay attention, right? Um, and, and these are known, um, these are known be benchmarks, right? And that's the second thing. These are known benchmarks. So it's easy to, you're, you're basically comparing apples with apples. Yeah. So, right. but you're totally correct. The, the whole point and the whole, where spiking networks and more biological AI really comes into its own is when you do start looking at, at interactions with the body and with the environment, because that's where the, the dynamics of, um, of a, a spiking network actually come to the fore, you know? The fact that, you know, and I, I mentioned this briefly in the paper, as you say, it's very dense um, and I don't expand on a lot of the ideas. Maybe that's you know another paper down the track and that'll be the 100-page paper rather than the six-page paper. But <laughs> um, the the dynamics of, of spiking networks are always transient, right? There's no stable state in, in the brain because a spike happens and then it's gone. It is actually just a moment in time. It's a unitary event. And so the the way that this processing actually unfolds is completely different to um, uh, an artificial neural network. And it's, when you think about it, our bodies, you know, we survive in time in the world. We perceive in time. Everything is transient. It's all dynamics. It's all dynamics, yeah. right? And so this is where spiking networks will really, I think, become particularly useful. And this is where, where, you know, gradient descent and artificial neural networks may be starting to hit a wall. I'm low to actually proclaim that definitely. Right. But in terms of, you know, interacting with the real world, the complexity of the real world, gathering enough data to train uh, a gradient descent model in the real world, these are all quite prohibitive at the moment. Whereas the dynamics of a spiking network and the, the rapid local learning that you get using thing, rules like spike time independent plasticity, they seem to be perfectly cut out for doing that job. Um, so, yes, it, it's it's actually a question that I that I kind of grapple with. Should we just keep trying to to um, go to the next benchmark and at least get close to matching what gradient descent is capable of doing on each of these benchmarks, or should we just dive right into the to the robotics side of things and show what um, what spiking networks are potentially capable of in the real world? Um, I mean, there's a risk, right? That if you follow the benchmarks that you're actually going to, it'll lead you to the incorrect solutions uh, because you're going to be tackling problems that you don't, that you won't eventually be tackling when you're in an embodied system, for example. That's entirely true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's one of the reasons that, that you know, I, I took this job in a, in a robotics institute, right? Even though I'm not actually working with the robots myself, I'm, I'm surrounded by them all the time. So it keeps them basically uh, front of my mind and, and I'm, Every day, every time a, a robot trundles past my desk, you know, it's like, okay, what's it doing and how could I get a spiking network to do that? And I've got this, this idea kind of like ticking over in the back of my mind all the time. Um, but it is a leap. It's a leap and it's a leap into the unknown. And I, um, it's, it's, it's probably a bit too ambitious and a bit too much of a chasm at the moment to really bridge. I think I need to understand, we all need to understand the, the dynamics and the capabilities of spiking networks a little bit better before we mm -hmm. make that leap. And so really the best way to do that is just on, on current benchmarks, I guess, as, as like trivial and mundane as, as it may seem. Every time I try a spiking network on a new data set, I learn something new. Right. And I think that's, that's the point. When I stop learning anything new um, by applying it to these you know, canned data sets, and standard benchmarks, that's when I'll stop doing it. All right, very good. So I'm gonna um, zoom us out and ask you kind of a larger question. And then I actually have a, uh, a guest question from the person who um, sent me your paper in the first place sure. before we wrap up here. So the, um, the zoom out, so this will be like the end of the public version and then the rest will be like a little bit extra for Patreon supporters. Um, so, okay. So the what we'll end on here in the public version is um, you don't write the acronym AGI or the phrase artificial general intelligence does not appear in that paper. Um, but you did mention it earlier. And, and um, part of the context that you mentioned it is that your kid has asked you, you know, when when is it going to when there's the when are you going to figure out AGI or is that what you're working on? I don't remember what the exact 
question was, but um, so but but you don't mention it. But looking at you know a list like uh, of the principles that we've been talking about, and, and this also has to do with, with um, me asking you what your goal was because I, I was going to guess maybe it's AGI. But so here's the question: you know, do you think that? Building these principles in is going to lead to AGI. Do you think that we're on our way to AGI, or do you even acknowledge AGI as a thing? Because I actually, I, I don't really, um, depending on how you define it. But um, where, do you, where are we in terms of that? If you think that we're headed that way, right, right. So I mean, that is the rub, isn't it? Like, how do you define AGI? I mean, we, it's really difficult to even define just intelligence in terms of well, what is intelligence for us, or what is intelligence for you know. Um, biology uh, and intelligence in the environment. I mean, it can mean so many different things. Um, so that's one of the reasons I left it out of the paper, I guess, because it is just such a load. That was intentional. Was it intentional that you didn't, uh, or I think it was intentional. Maybe it's so the... dense you couldn't even fit it in. It's... <laughs> Those three letters. Yeah. Um, I think it was probably at the back of my mind. I just thought, well, it's a loaded term, and it, in yeah. some respects, it's a little bit. Unless you're specifically talking about that. It's a little bit unscientific to bring it up, even you know, uh, because it, it's just so open to interpretation. So just mm. for the for the sake of, uh, I guess, trying to write you know the most rigorous paper that I could on this topic, I just didn't mention it. But of course, that's you know, I think everyone who works in AI has that has that in mind, right? Whether it's their goal or not, they they can kind of see that the field is probably heading in that direction. Um, so, you know. What do we mean by and this is this is the problem what do we mean by agi you know now for me you know I, I, there's this whole um before the idea of this embodied turing test which is really looking at animals um up to humans but starting with animals there was this idea of you know um can we build a robot that can just walk into a um an unknown house um find the kitchen make a cup of coffee for you you know a person could do that right pretty much any person at least in the western world can walk into almost any house in the world they know what a kitchen is they know what taps are they know where to get water they know that the kettle is going to be on on the shelf or in a cupboard somewhere if they can't see it they'll search for it um they'll find the coffee in a cupboard somewhere you know and they'll be able to make a cup of coffee in a house you've never seen before so this was a, a test that was proposed i think decades ago you know can we build a robot that can actually do this um <laughs> And that was, yeah, like I said, that was kind of like a precursor to the embodied Turing test. Now, would you call a robot that could do that? Would you call that, you know, an AGI? Um, I guess that's just arguing, you know, really semantics. Like that would be, a, yeah. we definitely don't have a robot that can do that right now. And if we could build a robot that could do that, it would be incredibly impressive. But more to the point, it'd be incredibly helpful, right? Um, Especially because I'm too lazy and depressed to go make myself a cup of coffee. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, just in terms of, yeah, you know, if it can do that, it can do pretty much any manual labor um, that, that we want it to. So and, and that's going to be incredibly useful and, and game changing for society. You know, and, you know, that's what Elon Musk is trying to do with the, um, the, the Tesla bot, uh, Optimus or whatever it's called. You know, oh. um, he's trying to, to change the, the face of labor globally. Um, of course, you know, I think it's it, that's very misguided because it's not just a matter of building the hardware. It's it's the real problem is the the real issue is control is the brain. It's the AI that controls the robot, and uh, and and that's a long way off. You know, we can build robots that are mm -hmm. physically capable, sure, but not mentally capable of actually carrying out the computation required to do these things. Um, so, you know, coming back to your AGI question, is that AGI? Would you call that AGI if a robot if we build a robot that can do those things? Um, I don't know. Semantics. Semantics. Yeah. Exactly. So in terms of... It's a bullshit term. It's <laughs> it is. A, I it mean, is. I, I've, yeah. I've come to hate the, the term artificial intelligence. And was it John McCarthy? One of the earliest AI folks in you know the Dartmouth um, um, summer uh, conference when, when they were going to figure out AI. I mean, I think it was John McCarthy who coined the phrase AI, I'm but artificial intelligence, and I'm butchering the history, but one of those guys, one of those researchers really hated the term and I really have come to dislike it myself. Um, yeah, I think, it, you know, it's, it's a loaded term and it's probably overused. Um, do you have any other reasons for, for disliking it? Uh, because it reifies intelligence as it, it sort of equates intelligence between biological organisms and not biological organisms. 
as if they're the same thing. And, you know, like we just said, there's all sorts of intelligences across species, different types of intelligences. So to say it's an artificial intelligence, um, as if it's one thing, right. is strange for me to conceptualize at this point. And, and so I guess what you're saying, it, it comes down in part to just our inability to even define what intelligence is, right? Let alone artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, we have to operationalize everything, which is fine. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Okay. No, no, I get that. So um, we're certainly heading towards more capable models. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well said. <laughs> uh, whatever you want to call okay. it, we're, we're, we're getting towards more capable models. At some point, they're actually going to be useful. And that's when it's really going to make a difference. Um, now, how do we make these things useful? You can argue that, I guess, chat GPT is already useful because people are actually using it. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> kids are using it for their assignment, their school assignments. But more to the point, people are using it in workplaces, you know, to write emails and, uh, I don't know, uh, draft up ideas, Code. brainstorming. Um, they, they're used in all sorts of different fields, right? really diverse fields. Um, Architects are using, you know, generative AI to, to, you know, brainstorm new ideas for for buildings. Um, hmm. So you know, it's 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 becoming useful already, um, but still, it's only in the digital useful in the digital domain. Um, so when when it becomes useful in the real world, you know, and I guess I'm talking robotics. Um, that's really going to be even more game changing, I would say. Okay, so we're winding down, and uh, I have one last question for you, and then I promise I'll let you go. And that is, um, do you see a role for consciousness in, <laughs> uh, in, in any of this? You know, is, is consciousness important? Is it a byproduct? What are your thoughts on that? And, you know, if we build in all of, if we integrate all these things, is, is consciousness going to emerge if it's a dynamical enough system, et cetera? Right. <laughs> well, that's, if, if you think AI or AGI is a loaded term, well, then consciousness is, is well, definitely. Well, Sure. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Awareness. Um, I don't know. What do we call it? I'm not sure what to call it. Um, no, I, I just mean anything, anything that's representative of that concept. Um, look, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very hard to kind of sum up. I've had like hour long discussions, um, you know, uh, with journalists and things about this and, and barely scratched the surface. So I don't think there's anything special about the human brain, right? or any animal brain that leads to consciousness. Um, that's almost like saying, um, if, if you believe that, then you you kind of have to believe that there's like, I guess like you, you're separating the mind and matter, right? If you, if you do that, um, you know, and uh, so can we emulate consciousness in a machine? I guess. Would it be useful to do so also? Well, would it be useful? Would it, but would it, would it be avoidable or if, is there some level of intelligence where consciousness just appears? Um, you know, so in other words, if we do build, you know, the loaded term AGI, um, or, or, you know, something that understands the world the way that we do, is it, is it necessarily going to be conscious? Um, I, th I tend to lean towards the answer being yes, it will, it will be conscious simply because there's just nothing special about the human brain. It is just uh, a whole heap of, you know, biochemical processes going on right it's, it's chemistry and physics that's that's what the brain is somehow that leads to this um you know <laughs> this innate subjective feeling of awareness that, that i have and that i presume you have although i can never know um and but it's 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 there's nothing special about the brain it is it is purely a physical thing that leads to a purely mental state of awareness um, so I think if you build something that computes like the brain does, but you build it in silicon and it uses, you know, pure electrical spikes rather than electrochemical spikes that are used in the brain, um, will it be conscious? I'd say there's a good chance that it will. Yes. Um, oh, I've just got a warning about my battery. That's okay. I think I've still got plenty. That's all right. Um, so I think, yes, the answer is yes, machines will be conscious at some point when we do get to that point. Exactly what that point is. Um, I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's a ridiculous and great place to end. So Pete, thank you for, um, staying so long with me and, and going down many roads. Um, and I'll, I'll point people obviously to the paper that we most discussed, but some of the other work where you've started implementing some of these things as well and in the show notes. 
So thanks for uh, coming on. Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Paul. I alone produce Brain Inspired. If you value this podcast, consider supporting it through Patreon to access full versions of all the episodes and to join our Discord community. Or if you want to learn more about the intersection of neuroscience and AI, consider signing up for my online course, Neuro AI, The Quest to Explain Intelligence. Go to braininspired.co to learn more. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. You're hearing music by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you. Thank you for your support. See you next time.